Hi, everybody. Um, I'm here with my dear friend, Andrew Harvey, and I'm here to uh, speak about his brand new book, Hedovich of Antwerp. A year, love is everything. Now, I know that you've never heard of Hadovich because I never heard of her before Andrew gave me a gave me the manuscript from this wonderful book. And while he was writing it, he was telling me endlessly about how wonderful this mystic was and is. And when I finally read the manuscript, I was over the moon. I thought it was one of the most beautiful, beautiful bodies of work I had ever, ever read. And obviously, I'm enchanted with mysticism. As you all know, anyone who knows me knows that. Um, and it's difficult really to explain what it is about mysticism that so takes your breath away. What it is about the writings of mystics that, that elevate you to a different level of um, thinking, a different level of life inside. And I, <clears throat> and I suppose it does for me what a lot of romantic movies do for people or a lot of fantasy movies. I know someone who saw Pirates of the Caribbean 18 times. I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. Because they go and they drift away. They drift away into some other place. And not, I'm immune to that. I'm absolutely immune to that. But to mystical literature, it elevates me to a level of truth mm. that I find so captivating. And truth takes me to a place where I can engage the chaos the world is in. I can engage the suffering with a perspective that allows me not to be overwhelmed, mm -hmm. that allows me to feel that we are moving through an era of, of transformation, that I don't get overwhelmed in the moment thinking, oh my God, what's going on here? And da 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 and, and one of the great errors people make when they're overwhelmed is to look backwards, to look backwards and say, we have to go back. We have to go back to the way it was. They have no common sense. They don't get enough. Evolution never moves backwards. That we are moving and we are forever evolving out of and toward. And what mystical literature does is it lifts you out of your fear instincts to move in a direction that doesn't serve your thinking. So I, I think in order to, before I'm even going to interview him, because it's not about me talking, but once I start, uh, <laughs> <laughs> once I start, um, I needed to share just a couple of Hadovich's uh, writings. They're not quite poems. They're, they're, expressions. The utterances. Really. They're utterances. Mm -hmm. And um, they're like songs of mm -hmm. sorts. And um, because you need to hear her voice in order to understand how the voice of someone from so long ago can still speak and be so relevant. So this is uh, the day of Andrew's wonderful book, Love is Everything. And honestly, by love, I think that is how we should describe the power of God, how we feel God in our hands and in our life is what love is. It's, it's how we know God. What does God feel like? What is the power of God? It is what love can do in our lives if we let it go, if we let it go through us. So she writes on May 21st, what I desire, I cannot represent prisoner as I am of not knowing. Our spirit cannot understand nor our words translate what it finds in itself. What a strange story, one that throws me into chaos. What is hidden from others is naked to me. Understand this simplicity and you will be love's prisoner forever. For there are very few who live love this far. She's talking about being a prisoner to her understanding of the nature of God as it's revealing that it's not about personal love. It's just 
love and <clears throat> as it flowed through her. And she was elevated by this. So as much as I want to keep reading, I've talked too long, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh. So my dear, I want to start by asking you how you found her manuscript and what inspired you to take on the task mm. of bringing this body of work to everybody, for which everyone honestly should be grateful. Thank you, darling, and thank you so much for always being such a champion of my crazy work. And thank you especially for this amazing quote that you gave, the book. And I'm just going to read the last part of it, because if I had put Carolyn out on drugs and forced her by a hypnotic suggestion to write something marvellous, she couldn't have written anything more wonderful and more helpful than this. Hadovich's writings are breathtaking. They are like depth charges in the soul. The woman can write. I am in awe of this magnificent book and so grateful to Andrew for bringing Hadovich of Antwerp's writings into the world again. I cannot thank you enough for those words. I they get every the whole one of them. <laughs> but before I say anything about her, I'd love to read you the poem that I first met her in. I was in my 30s. I was going through a tumultuous and very bewildering mystical transformation, which was making my head spin like Sybil, and which I had <laughs> nobody to talk to about. Light was appearing. I was seeing people surrounded by auras. I was having dreams in which people from the past were speaking to me. And a bit of me thought I was going crazy. And certainly some of my friends thought I was going crazy. But I was already working with Rumi. And so I knew that what was happening to me was in its way natural in the realm in which these amazing, terrifying, wonderful things happen. And one day I was staggering around where I lived in Paris in the 7th, and I went into my favorite bookstore, La Hune, and I saw this book saying, L'amour est tout. And it was a translation by a woman with a wonderful name, Rosa van der Plas. And it was a French translation of Hadovich, and I opened the book at this point, and it blew my brains out. So I'd love to read you my translation of it. Because everything about Hadovich, what makes her so stunning and original and fierce and magnificent and timely is in this book. And it's the poem of a very evolved, grand female mystic who has had to fight for the authority of her voice against the full lunacy of the boys club. And that, of course, is one of the many reasons why it's so important now, because so many of the greatest teachers on the planet are female mystics. So, this is for all of you amazing women who are finding your own amazing voice despite all the twists and turns and tortures of the patriarchy. Here she is. My torment is great and unknown to men. They are cruel to me. They want to swerve me from everything love drives me to. They do not understand love. And I cannot explain it to them. What love inspires my spirit, in this is my being, and for this I will do my all. Whatever ordeals for love's sake men lead me through, I pray to stand firm and take no harm from them. I know from the nobility of my soul that in suffering for sublime love I conquer. And so I joyfully abandon myself in pain, in peace, in dying, in living, for I know the command of high fidelity. I do not complain of suffering for love. It is my duty to submit to her always, whether she commands in storm or stillness, she can be known only in herself. This is an inexpressible wonder. 
which has filled my heart and made me stray in a wild desert. Oh my God, that is such an incredible poem. And I realized when I read that poem in French that I was in the presence of someone whom I could never have imagined. Had you before. heard of her up to that point? I'd never heard of her. I was just wondering, stunned on my experiences around Paris, and I went into the bookstore to try and find something, and I was guided, like you are, you know, when you're in that state. God provides. Well, tell everyone who had a Vichy Van Oh, yes, I will. If I can. Um, actually, we know very little about her, which is rather wonderful in a way, because, as you'll see, we are meeting her in a way for the first time. Hadovich lived probably in the early part of the 13th century, in the mystical spring of the Beguine movement. She was a Beguine, and the Beguines were a group of very feisty, very visionary, very independent women who'd had enough with being slaves in the marital world where they had no rights at all no property rights, couldn't choose anything, couldn't vote, couldn't do anything, and were fed up also with the prospect of having to go into convents because they wanted to live an independent, interdependent spiritual life. Intellectual life. Intellectual well. life, but they earned their money by doing works for the people around them, by serving the sick, by laundry, by all kinds of things. They lived in little communities and they kept each other vibrantly alive. And at first the church thought this was rather a good idea. But then what happened is that some of them started to write glorious, amazing, radical, revolutionary work out of what they were receiving of the Christ consciousness. And what they were receiving of the Christ consciousness made the boys' club extremely nervous because it came from the independent, empowered, sacred feminine. So in 1312, one of these great begins, Margaret Peretti, was burned at the stake for what she got up to, and that put the kibosh on the movement. But I'm going ahead of myself. But what I wanted to tell you is that Hadovich belongs to the first period of this glorious, mystical, feminist, empowered movement of women. And her work just blazes with that freedom that those amazing women claim for themselves. I'm going to interrupt here and say something. Ah. It's hard to describe the power of the sacred feminine, or even what it means, but how through the centuries it has erupted. It has erupted to try and influence spiritual thought and the, <clears throat> the real power of what the spirit is. And it has been squashed again by, and again <clears throat> by the politics of, right. of, of, the, the, of the, the boys club, of the, boys the club. patriarchy okay. yeah. I, I, of the patriarchy. Mm. And uh, which is why the class that Matt Fox is offering right now, by the way, on, on beyond patriarchy is mm. so significant. And what's happening now is yet another rise and the need for the feminine mystical, the, the real the, mystical the, the, feminism, the really mystical feminine right. to rise up and understand what that is and the capacity for women and men and right. men, the mystical masculine and the mystical feminine, I'm a man. to rise up and really empower yourselves to see truth. Right. So I just I had to say that because it's the, the timing of well, why, why do you think you found it now? Well, I'll I'll get to that, now, but let I'm me just tell up. you about her. Okay, let me just get it into perspective for you all. Who's this amazing mystical feminist? Is first of all, she was born probably in that first mystical spring. The second thing we know about her is that she's probably of aristocratic lineage because she was fabulously well-educated. She read Latin, she read the great commentaries of Bernard de Claveau, of Guillaume de Saint-Thierry, of Saint Augustine. They saturate her own knowledge. She also read French because she studied the troubadours and their very grand, intricate vision of love and married what she learned from the male mystics with this very extraordinary philosophy of love. 
she was probably, from the evidence of her letters, she was probably the guide to a group of rather lazy ladies, because her letters are full of exhortations to them to get more serious about the work that they were supposed to be doing. And certainly, when we get this from the letters and from the poems, she endured a lot of oppression from the boys' club, from the priests, who were quite clearly deeply threatened by this astounding woman claiming full mystical power and full female Christhood. She was also thrown out at a certain time of her own community. She must have been very much too much, and ended her life as a homeless beggar wandering the countryside and may well have died as an unpaid helper in a leper colony. So it's a very extreme life. She left, however, thank God, 14 visions, some amazing letters and some poems of incredible intensity and beauty, both in stanza form and in strophe form, that have been astounding to those who discovered them. But what happened for about 70 years after her death was that her work spread all over Germany and spread all over what was then Flemish country and she influenced the two greatest male mystics of the Middle Ages, Reisberg, who quoted liberally from her and quite clearly was completely gobsmacked by her because he robbed a lot from her without actually telling it, and Meister Eckhart, who met her work when he started to explore his extraordinary vision of mysticism. And it's quite clear from recent scholarship that a lot of what we thought was so original about Eckhart actually comes from this bird, Hadovich. <laughs> What happened then was what happens to the incredible empowered voices of women, and it's happened in many mystical systems. In Buddhism, the work of Yeshi Sogyal, who was the consort of Padma Sambhava in the ninth century, and has recently been rediscovered, but was lost for a long time. Rabia was always revered within the Muslim tradition, but it's only now that she's been given her real place. And what happened to Hadovich was that her great trumpet of a voice, this vast, vast voice, was silenced for six centuries. She just vanishes off the scene. And it was because three little nerds called, and these names you can't make up, Willems, Moan, and Snellet, <laughs> in 80 How do you remember that? Oh, God. Uh, I'd have to have that on Willem, I remember when I first read those words, I thought, Willems, Moan, and Snellet, you can't make this up. They were little, nice little nerds, and they were in the Royal Library in Brussels in 1830. And what did they discover? They discovered two volumes of Hadovich, of Antwerp. And they were sufficiently educated to know that this was a momentous discovery. And then another marvelous manuscript, very more detailed and more accurate, was discovered in the University of Ghent at the end of the century. And then this Jesuit guy, Van Mierlo, who was a young man at the time, got taken over by Hadovich, a state I know well, and spent the next 50 years of his life, until his death in 1956, really making sure that the most accurate possible renditions of her work would get out to the world. As his editions started to come out, translations appeared in French and German and Italian, but she was absolutely ignored for a long time in the English-speaking world until a decent woman called Mother Columba Hart, of blessed memory, did a very boring and very flat translation of her can, her whole works for the Polish press. And I don't don't say that with any degree of professional jealousy. It, it, they are flat. They just don't get anywhere near the intensity and passion and wonder of her work. But she wrote a hell of an introduction, which has been very valuable to me. What happened was that I didn't dare do any translations of Hadovich for 30 years. I met her in my 30s, and I continue to dip into her. But in my 60s, I'm 70 now. I'm actually six months older than Calvin, so I can bust her around. Ouch. Yeah, I'll try that one. And <laughs> what happened was that in my 60s, I realized, oh, my 
God, this world is... Oh, we got to watch the time. What I realized in my 60s is that this world is falling apart. What we need is to bring back the great mystics to give us the courage, the foundation, the wisdom, the brilliance to really do what Carolyn was saying, which is to have a vast perspective, to calm down, carry on, fueled by sacred wisdom, sacred knowledge. So I worked on Rumi and then Kabir, but then finally, I had a series of dreams at the beginning of COVID in which Adovich basically said, when are you going to devote yourself to me? When are you going to get this great female voice out, which the world so desperately needs? I mean, she was pretty bossy about it. I think Carolyn sent her, actually. And what happened then is that I plucked up the courage. I learned medieval Flemish, medieval Dutch, enough to be able to read her in the original. And if you read her in the original, oh my God, her language is visceral, passionate, gutsy. It's like your whole body shakes when you read it. I'll give you one word, which is one of her favorite words. She talks a lot about love being a very stormy, thrilling, devastating experience at times. And the word that she uses for storm is orovert, O-R-O-W-O-E-T, orovert. Storm is pretty good word, but orovert really does convey the kind of mangling and dissolution and raging that goes on in the mystical journey when you get possessed by love, and her whole language is like that. Then I plunged into the different translations of her in, in the languages I read in German, Italian, and French, and they offered me tremendous clues. Then I translated the whole damn thing, and I thought that I'd finished. I was very proud of myself. I took a lot of wild work. I spent about four months without sleep because working on Hadovich doesn't really allow you sleep. I slept two hours at night, and then she would come again and possess me, and I would do it. And then I realized, oh my God, I can't just produce a nice scholarly version of Hadovich, however intense the translations might be. That would just get to a few people, and she has to get out to as many people who can hear her at this moment. And then I went into six months of real suffering because I really realized I had to be able to do a day book and I had to be guided directly by her to be able to pace the unraveling, unfolding of this stupendous and very grand vision. It's as if I'd been given um, a manuscript of the Bach B minor mass, discovered it, and had been given the responsibility of introducing Bach to the planet. You wouldn't start with the B minor mass because it would just blow people's minds out. They wouldn't really know. So you have to do it step by step by step so that you get the whole rich vision together. So I went through those six months and I got this graded revelations together in a day book. And here is the book. And the last thing that I will say, now God knows, I could go on and on as you probably can tell, the last thing that I'd like to say is that I commissioned from this the world's most wonderful icon painter, my beloved friend, Father Bill McNichols, who's also a friend of Karen's, this icon of her. And you can see that he has done a masterpiece, somebody very grand, tormented, exalted, absolutely her. This is the first representation of her in spiritual history. So that's my story. Well, uh, before I bring this wonderful, wonderful telling to an end, which is just magnificent, how do people get your book? Well, it's on Amazon. It's called Love is Everything, A Year with Hadovich of Antwerp, 365 Poems, Visions and Contemplations. And it is published by Medio Media, which is the publishing wing of a vast Christian mystical organization centered in a monastery in France, in Bonvo, and run by my oldest buddy, who, thank God, fell crazily in love with Hadovich and has dedicated his publishing house to getting this out to the world. It's on Amazon now. Please, please, please. 
buy it and plunge in. She will change your life. She's changed mine. She's rocked Carolyn's world, and that's hard to do, let me tell you. I've been so amazed at how Hadowitz has really inflamed Carolyn's great, wild, noble soul. Well, I, I will say it is not my way to promote. Um, I know. It's just not my way. I'm not a promoter and like that. But when I think, when I find something as valuable that I think really will be of value to you, then I do it. So thank I you. thank you. Andrew. Thank you, darling. Thank you. And I thank you for listening and for considering having Hadovich as an addition to your library and to your soul. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.